the way I talk through pa this with patients is, did your biopsy demonstrate prostate cancer? And if it demonstrated prostate cancer, is it the kind of prostate cancer that we need to treat right now? Or is it the kind of prostate cancer that we can safely follow or monitor over time? So who needs a prostate biopsy? Somebody who has abnormal blood testing, they go on to get an MRI. That's our regular pathway. Who do we say you don't need an MRI? Men who have bilateral hip replacements, an MRI is effectively useless. So we don't do an MRI for those individuals. We can calculate PSA density with an ultrasound. And it's fast, it's cheap, it's effective. Otherwise, people are go. We, we have everyone go to an MRI. It's worth it that Even much. Even with a single hip replacement? Single hip. Our radiologists are really good, and a good radiologist can read an MRI effectively with a single hip. If somebody has profound anxiety and they need general anesthesia for something, we'll be nuanced about whether or not we think an MRI makes sense. But for the average person, 99.5% of people, you know, you get an MRI. Now, MRI shows a suspicious lesion. Three, four, or five on the pyrads. Arads, three, four, or five, you need a biopsy. MRI shows. Sorry, independent of PSA density? Independent of PSA density. Okay. If your MRI shows um, no lesion, but a high PSA density, so a young man, let's say under 60, that's a PSA density of more than 0.1 or 0.12. Yep. If you're older, I'll give you a little bit more of a le longer leash, and we'll say 0.15 over 65 or 70. If you have a PSA density that's below that threshold, and you have a high PSA, low percent free, et cetera, you need a biopsy in my opinion, okay? We're gonna include, Ted, the slide that you shared with me a couple months ago that I still have, I still look at it all the time yeah. now, which shows by pyrads, by PSA density, yes. the outcome of biopsies. That's right. And it's mind boggling. Yes, so PSA density is a huge, variable in terms of impacting probability of having cancer when you sample a suspicious lesion yep. and or the volume or bulk of that particular aggressiveness of that particular lesion. So RADS 3, 4, or 5, you need, a, you need a biopsy unless your PSA density is incredibly low. Like 0.02. Yeah. Yeah. Which, by the way, patient, we... They, sometimes they have it, yes. So there's, there's, ne there's never always and there's never nevers in medicine, right? Yep. But in general, that was what we would say. If you have a negative MRI and a, and a, and a high PSA density, you, we will often suggest a biopsy for you. And if you have a um, negative MRI and a low PSA density, we'll say you're likely can be monitored. Yep. Now, we'll put in the show links a nice figure that illustrates that from a large group of uh, about 10 institutions pooling all of their MRI and biopsy data together. However, I have the for good fortune of having a, a partner who's a brilliant guy. He t analyzed- This is Ashley. Ashley Ross. Mm -hmm. He analyzed and built a neural network real-time predictor for all patients, not just Northwestern medicine patients, but we used all the Northwestern medicine patients in our system who had had PHI, MRI, and a biopsy and looked at all their outcomes. So there's some selection bias because we didn't include people who didn't have a biopsy, but in general, we took all these people and we created a neural network real-time predictor for what's your absolute risk for having prostate cancer in general, but more specifically, prostate cancers that would require treatment. And that we'll put in the show links. That is a super powerful this tool. This is the model. This is the MyNM risk calculator. Okay, so yeah. we'll make sure we link So that the as figure well. is great because it just gives you an idea of a framework, but the actual risk calculator gives the individual patient their individualized risk. So he built it off around 16, 1700 MRI biopsy linked cases, but now that has grown because it's, it's always learning. Now, if you undergo a prostate biopsy, it's not just, the answer is not just cancer, yes or no. There's a lot of subtlety and a lot of things have changed about how we think about these different cancers. So I always explain to patients that it's basic, effectively, when a pathologist looks at a biopsy sample under the microscope, they're describing the pattern of the, of the cancer gland. We talked about this at the beginning, the prostate is an exocrine gland that produces semen. And there's an architecture of the gland or the duct that a normal prostate has. So think about like a branching tree. When you develop a cancer, it's an abnormal developed branch. 
And so the pathologist will score how abnormally developed that duct or that branch is. And that score is what ends up being the Gleason score. Now the pathologist tells us if you have a cancer, what does the individual branch look like? What's the pattern? That would be the Gleason pattern. And then the patterns today are pattern three, pattern four, and pattern five. But what we get in the summation report is, well, how much pattern three cancer do you have? How much pattern four cancer do you have? And how much pattern five cancer do you have? And that's the Gleason sum, or what we now call, what was also referred to as the Gleason score. So the common ones would be three plus three equals six. That means that the pathologist only saw abnormal glandular patterns that were pattern three. So the pathologist is always reporting the highest scores that they see? They're reporting the most common pattern they see first. That's the first number. Okay. And then the second most common pattern of cancer that they see as number two. Okay. okay. And this is on both sides. They Once they're looking at they this- They take the, every single sample, they tell you the score. Okay. So, and typical number of samples that should be done in a decent biopsy? It's 12 systematics. Okay. So that's right side, left side, kind of every five millimeters kind of approach, plus you sample the target. And the recommendation number of samples of a target is usually three. So two is inadequate because the needle can bend, it can deflect. Sometimes the needle is, is going in 20 centimeters beyond your hand. So you have to account for the deflection and you can track it. But the idea is you do it three times. I mean, talk about user error potential, right? Like think about the difference between you and me doing a prostate biopsy. It's like, I mean. I know you could do it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but like it, it requires even skill. within the field yeah. of urology, like there has to be a difference in skill. Yeah, and that's what the training is part of. And, and Ashley and I actually host a course where we put on and, and train anybody who's interested in how to do a proper, good, transperineal prostate biopsy, for example. Because oh, Hopefully this is just technology. limited to physicians. Yeah, so it'll, it'll be helpful. And obviously, um, you know, there is a skill involved with, and, and you can tell there's a skill involved with doing the biopsy, and there's a skill involved by the pathologist when they report it out. So the requirements or the recommendations are that you declare the Gleason score. That's the sum of the most common and the second most common cancer. Now, presumably, um, some of these core samples come back with no cancer yeah. in them. And is it's, that just reported as nothing? They it's, report no cancer. Okay, got it. So it's no cancer or at at best 3-3. Three, three. Yes. Well, they'll so no cancer. Some, there's some rare variants that are not cancer and they're not benign. They'll tell us about them. That would be like prosthetic atypia. But that's uncommon, especially in the era of MRI targeted biopsies only. Okay. And, and so I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. And you're biopsying only the peripheral zone? You, well, we biopsy where the lesion is, but most prostate cancers originate in the peripheral zone. They can invade- But the 12 systematic biopsies peripheral zone. peripheral zone. A How big, thick is that, by the way? It depends on the size of the prostate. So in a young man, it's about um, four to five millimeters thick. And in, in a guy who has a big prostate, let's say a 100 gram prostate, the total peripheral zone volume does not change in a man over time. So does that mean it actually gets thinner? Is it the gets compressed and thinned out, particularly if you have benign prosthetic overgrowth. Wow. So, so it makes the, it harder to biopsy. It makes it harder to biopsy. Absolutely. So that's where skill definitely plays a role. So you have to really understand what you're doing. I mean, you know, not any, you know, it's not like anybody can. I mean, this is not to take away from breast biopsies and things like that, but this is a, or a thyroid biopsy, but this is a totally different. Totally different. This is much more complicated. In my opinion, yes, for sure. Because it's not like you're just, you know, sure, a thyroid or breast, you're trying to target the a a abnormal, but we're, yeah. yes, there's a lot of subtlety to it. You have to know what you're doing. And yes, the total peripheral zone volume remains the same over time. So if your prostate size increases, the air, the actual, the thickness of that peripheral zone goes way down. Yeah. In other words, another way to just get this back to our analogy is you're having to biopsy the skin of the orange. Yes. And if it's a small orange, the skin is a certain thickness, which is yeah. relatively thin. The bigger the orange gets, you have to preserve the amount of skin. So the skin gets thinner and thinner yeah, and thinner. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So now what do you do with these Gleason scores? So you take a look at them and you say, what is the score? And then what's the distribution and what's the volume of the score? 
because the two things matter in terms of determining what the next steps for the patient are. In general, the way I talk through pa this with patients is, you know, did your biopsy demonstrate prostate cancer? And if it demonstrated prostate cancer, is it the kind of prostate cancer that we need to treat right now? Or is it the kind of prostate cancer that we can safely follow or monitor over time? Okay, so let's start with patient comes in, both the lesion and the periphery are 3-3. Three, three. Yeah. So if somebody, so Gleason 6 prostate cancer, that's Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6 prostate cancer, is the least aggressive type of prostate cancer when you look at it under the microscope. And it has a very favorable prognosis, meaning um, those prostate cancers, the thought process should be, um, I need to find some data that will convince me that this cancer requires treatment because the recommendation on average is that these cancers can be monitored. Now, what are the variables that affect whether or not we think someone should have their cancer treated? Sorry, just to make sure I understand that, Ted. Does that mean a 3 plus 3 can't spread or metastasize unless it progresses to a 3, 4, for example? Good, excellent question, and that's been explored um, with one major caveat. That is that it's been explored in surgical series. So in individuals- So there's a biopsy, who, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bias already introduced Huge there. bias. Yeah. But if you look at radical prostatectomy series in men- um, who had Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Um, there's a large series by John Epstein at Hopkins and also Scott Egner at University of Chicago. They both showed that there was no lymph node metastasis in men with Gleason 6 prostate cancer. So just make sure we understand that. Any man who underwent a prostatectomy with a Gleason 3 plus 3 had lymph node negative disease and yes. therefore by extension, presumably, they never went on to get metastatic. They never had a recurrence. They they never had at the time of their surgery ah. never had. So what's the longitudinal lethal... data on those folks? Do we know that they're free? Well, of they disease? do very well. They're like the probability that they would die from prostate cancer is very very low, but they could have a local recurrence, for example, and okay. that could result in subsequent problems and need for additional secondary therapies. Okay. But on average, we know that a Gleason six prostate cancer that is of low volume can be safely monitored because. But it hang on a second. Why did those men have cancer surgery then? Because we have evolved how we manage them. I see. So based it, on those data, we yeah. now would be less That likely. was the person that I operated on. We operated on Hopkins when I was training, where one core Gleason 6. We thought because they had a cancer that they required immediate treatment. But okay, so this is so this is now very different very from different. the colorectal cancer model. Yeah. In colorectal cancer, you have an adenomatous polyp. It comes out. You have a yes. carcinoma in situ, it comes out. Yeah, the difference is because in the colorectal model, you can easily resect the adenomatous polyp with minimal or no side effects. I see. So done it's the with the colonoscopy. Yeah, it's the morbidity of the prostatectomy. Similarly, in the breast, right? DCIS, it's coming out. You know, debate whether we should radiate or not. But yes. We treat pre cancer so aggressively in these other organs. Yes. And here, but in that, in that way, in the positive light of things, urologists have been very progressive and have been at the forefront of doing surveillance for tumors that have not yet established or declared that they have lethal potential. So how often do you get a man, Ted, uh, or maybe let me reframe it this way, for every 100 men who you see who have a Gleason 3 plus 3, how many say, Dr. Schaefer, I understand what you just said about the data. I don't want this thing in me. Take it out. Yeah. I mean, it's rare that I will offer my surgical services to that person because um, there's a lot of new, and sometimes the patients don't fully understand what the potential ramifications for their side effects may be. Meaning so, the, ri the surgical risks. Yeah. yeah. Or radiation risks. Yeah. So what I will do is I will do, a, I will jump, jump through a lot of hoops to look for reasons to reassure that that patient that they do not have an aggressive lethal situation and most of the time are successful now so, so a man is diagnosed with gleason 6 prostate cancer if it is of low volume let's call that between one and four cores which is the most common thing that we would find okay and that one or four samples of a systematic biopsy or 
if you target a lesion on the MRI, we consider that just be one region. So if you did five samples of an MRI suspicious RADS4 lesion and all five samples came out Gleason 6, we would just call that one area of visible cancer. In those situations, we, we generally would say, you are somebody who is a candidate who can have their prostate cancer followed because at this time, your tumor does not have the lethal potential to spread to your lymph nodes or other parts of your body and all kinds of therapy to treat it carry more morbidity than just leaving it in place and just monitoring it. Yeah, it's amazing. And you're right. It's really precision medicine. Mm -hmm.